Arjuna, on the eve of the battle, is overlooking the, thank you so much, is overlooking the, the battlefield, and he sees all of, of his friends and family on the other side, his teachers are, are lined on the other side, and they're, they're all out there ready to die, fighting against him and his brothers. Um, and he panics, and, and he's not ready to fight. Um, and his chariot driver turns out not to be just an ordinary chariot driver, but is actually God, um, and which is yeah, awesome, right? So Lord Krishna uh, turns to him um, and says, let me explain to you why you need to go. And Arjuna argues against him, not realizing that it's God. Um, and ultimately, um, uh, Krishna has to reveal himself to Arjuna, who is doubtful up until that point, and says, these worlds would collapse if I did not perform action. I would create disorder. In society, living beings would be destroyed. Therefore, following in his footsteps, wise men should act with detachment to preserve the world. And he pushes Arjuna um, out the door to, to, to fight against his relatives. So the point of that entire passage, which is the culmination of the Mahabharata, um, is that it's absolutely necessary to fight, and it's also a duty to fight when you are fighting for the right reasons for a just cause. Failure to fight would be failure not only to do as Krishna asked you to do, but failure to ensure order and peace and good at the expense of creating chaos, disorder, and evil. Um, this separates also the Hindu ethical perspective from the Western just war tradition. Arguably, a just cause, even when all the other ad valum principles are met, create a permissive right within traditional just war thought. One may fight under these circumstances in the West, but one is not necessarily obligated to do so. By contrast, for the kingly caste, for the Kshatriya, like Arjuna, using force is an obligation when it is necessary. So even though he has to do something that's very distasteful to him in fighting against friends and family, Family, it's, it's not a choice. He has no choice in the matter. Although the Hindu tradition restricts the use of uh, just force to the Kshatriya caste, there is not a specific set of ideas limiting such usage to a particular individual or set of individuals as there is in the Western principle or Islamic principle of legitimate authority. So, um, although the text will talk about a king having a right to use force or a prince having a right to use force, it's actually referring to an entire caste of, of, of individuals, um, which makes it rather different. Um, furthermore, the Hindu tradition does not distinguish between private and public uses of force, nor between domestic and international ones. They're all considered um, on par on the same sort of, of level. The focus, um, in terms of thinking about just cause, um, is on the things that prompt people to fight rather than the legitimate causes for fighting. Um, and so, for example, there's a tendency in the text to list possible provocations that lead to war or types of war rather than to, to rank them by legitimacy. Um, in Kautilya's Arthasastra, which is a sort of political science text, um, Indra divides just war into four classes, wars caused by invasion of one's territory, wars caused by something done to others prejudicial to your powers, wars resulting from some dispute about boundaries, and wars caused by some disturbance of the mandala. I'll talk about that uh, mandala in a moment. Um, each type of war relates in some way to restoration or preservation of order, whether domestic, international, or cosmic. Um, so if you were to try to boil this down to a single type of just cause, it's ca just cause is fighting to preserve order. Um, the hin although Hinduism doesn't uh, specifically list, list causes in the, in the usual way, it does have an ancient tradition of what we might call today international relations analysis, where the world is conceived along the lines of a mandala system. At the center is a powerful king surrounded by, by other kings, um, spreading outward in concentric rings. A wise king knows his position in the system. He knows how close he is to the center. He knows whether his neighbors are stronger or weaker um, and tries to make the best of, of his position. When he is strong, he defeats peer competitors to prevent future problems. So our conversation about preventative war yesterday, um, it's not a problem if you happen to be the wise king. Um, when weak, he seeks alliances with the more powerful and avoids trouble, tries to avoid getting into conflict with, with his neighbors. This worldview would be seen as uh, encouraging a sort of imperial spread. Um, and the stronger the king in the center, the more stable the system. The argument is actually made that if you had a very powerful king in the center who could subsume all the kings underneath him, you would have the situation for world <coughs> peace, aka the world under a single government. Um, this being said, while, while imperialism strikes us as, as disturbing, um, in this case, we should think of it as, as something that could actually be creating peace and order. First of all, um, 
it's presumed that only a good and a wise king would have the power to expand. The qualities of good kingship are tied to moral virtues. Without the moral virtues, a king cannot succeed. So the only person who could succeed in, in acquiring all of this power in the Mandala system would be someone who deserved to succeed. Second, it's assumed that the king intends to further the good of the state by seeking its expansion. This follows naturally from the first presumption, since a virtuous king would not seek personal aggrandizement. Um, the argument is that acquiring new territory adds wealth and power to the king's home state, which, because of course he's a good king, will, he will use to take care of the people's needs and to defend them against internal and external enemies. Furthermore, the acquisition of new territory brings more people under the benign rule of the good king, keeping in mind that the conqueror's king is a virtuous one, and his goal is the good of his people. He's expected to be magnanimous in conquest. And here we have a little bit to say with use post bellum. Um, the people of the annexed territory are to be treated as equals with his original citizenry, so they become citizens on par with, with those who he was already responsible for. Their interests and defense are now the king's obligation. Thus, he cannot sap the territory dry, transferring its resources to his distance and imperial capital. In addition, the conquering king is expected to keep the traditional religious and legal structures of the conquered territories in place. And in some cases, this may even mean rehabilitating the former leadership. Presuming the former king or prince was not evil, but merely weak, um, the conqueror should put him, or if necessary, a close family member of the king, back in charge after um, having conquered the territory. So if you can sort of imagine what this would have looked like in Iraq, we would have taken Saddam out of power temporarily, chided him, instructed him in his duties if he didn't understand them. We would have replaced him with one of his sons, who would then be the local regional governor um, in Iraq under sort of US tut tutorial uh, charge. Um, prisoners of war and slaves taken during the course of the war are to be freed upon the ending of war. Um, a few other just causes can be uh, pulled out besides this idea of imperial expansion. Um, one is the idea of righting wrongs. Um, the Mahabharata, the story I just told you a little bit about, is a key, key case in point, as is the Ramayana. The bad guys are criminal. Um, they're not just unvirtuous, right? They, they commit various offenses. Um, and in order to stop this lawlessness, um, one, one must fight against them. Kings are also obligated to rescue the oppressed, uh, which is an idea that comes out particularly in the Mahabharata as well. Um, and perhaps the whole story of the Ramayana where Rama is rescuing his kidnapped uh, wife is, is a similar sort of story. Um, tyrannicide and regime change may be legitimate, although you can't do it yourself, right? So the people themselves are not permitted to do it, but another king can intervene on, the king's, uh, on another king's behalf. Um, so one example of this um, is a story from the Mahabharata um, where a young Brahmin, a young priest, uh, curses his king for making um, the father of the Brahmin carry a corpse, which is an unclean act. And his father says to him, I don't approve of his crime, yet our like must always condone the ruling king. The law that is hurt hurts back. Were the king not to protect us, we would be severely oppressed. We would not be able to live the law as we desire. So the people themselves can't, can't uh, rise up against the kingly caste, but another member of the kingly caste is purely welcome to do so. Um, and in this case, uh, you'll be happy to know a good king does intervene. Um, I should note that there's no mention of religion or ideology as a just cause across any of these, these texts. Um, the principle of last resort does exist. Um, in the Mahabharata, the good guys wait more than 13 years. Um, in the Ramayana, uh, Rama waits something like seven years before um, fighting back to get uh, what was arguably theirs in the first place. Um, in addition, the Arthasastra, which is one of these political texts, says that even when the advantages of peace and war are equal, one should prefer peace, for war causes loss of power and wealth and is troublesome and sinful. Um, there's lots of warnings throughout the tradition that war's results are unpredictable. The Code of Manu points out it can be observed that neither victory nor defeat belongs permanently to either of the two powers who fight in battle. Therefore, one should avoid fighting. Um, because you know, if you can settle it through diplomacy, you might actually get what you want, whereas once you go into battle, there's no guarantee that the good side uh, will, will win. Um, so there's lots of suggestions in the various texts to pursue diplomacy first, to pursue um, what we might consider today covert actions first, um, and to, to end with open battle um, as only as a last resort. Um, 
Finally, there is a point about what makes an, a war unjust, which is made quite clearly in most of the text, but I have only four minutes. So to summarize it, um, I will say, thou shalt not take what is not yours, um, and thou shalt not act out of greed or personal self-aggrandizement. Okay. So, now that we've figured out what you can fight for and about, we should talk about um, how one should fight. And the key words here are honor and fairness. The Hindu tradition includes principles for fighting a war according to dharma, which can be understood broadly as legal principles. This type of dharma yudha or legal war is in contrast with a dharma yudha, which are wars which are not fought according to the rules. In the latter, various dishonorable stratagems, sneak attacks, deceptive ruses, assassins, and poisons can be used, as well as non-standard military forces. While the two categories of war are not considered morally equivalent, the choice of which to use is left up to the king as a matter of rational political choice. A weak king may make use of dishonorable stratagems if necessary. A strong king ought to fight an open war using the higher standard. Um, the break preventing abuse of this choice is that kings are frequently reminded in the literature to be careful realists. They should not overestimate their means and they should carefully examine their personal motivations for excitement and power are not synonymous, right? So the idea that you might be very excited about fighting a war um, and the idea that you might actually have some capacity to win it are not the same thing. Um, kings are also, is that me? No, that's not me, that's you. Sorry. <laughs> um, kingdoms are also, we both have iPhones, so um, we're sort of desperately shutting off the timer. I only got a new 20 minutes. I think we were down to four, however. Um, okay. Um, so, kings are also encouraged to avoid violating conventions, for evil will be repaid with evil. Um, in thinking about the inbello rules expressed within Dharma Yuda, the Hindu tradition begins at a point parallel to Augustine. One must fight virtuously for a virtuous end. To some extent, good behavior flows naturally from the fact that presumably a good king will tend to exhibit good qualities in his <coughs> behavior. There are two broad sets of rules regarding violence in war. First, non-combatants and their property must be spared. Some individuals belong to the category of non-combatants because of who they are. Peasants, beggars, women, children, and Brahmin, the priestly caste, are all to be immune from attack because of their membership in these groups. Um, for example, the Sauptika asserts that one should not cast weapons upon one's kin, that's Arjuna's problem, upon Brahmins, kings, again his problem, uh, women, friends, one's own mother, one's own preceptor, a weak woman, an idiot, a blind man, a sleeping man, a terrified man, one just risen from sleep, an intoxicated person, and one that is heedless. Um, ambassadors and envoys are also considered immune. The duty of hospitality renders guests and those seeking asylum or refuge and also illegitimate targets. Now obviously the second half of that list seem to be quite different from the first half. The first half are people who are immune because of who they are. The second half are immune because of what they are doing at the moment, right? They're being intoxicated or they're running away. Um, these non-combatants, uh, who are non-combatants because of their specific behaviors, are individuals, even soldiers, um, who do not pose threats for one reason or another. So the common theme across all of them is that they can't pose a threat. They're injured or otherwise disabled. They're struck with incapacitating fear, temporarily blinded, or have broken weapons, um, which poses some really interesting uh, ideas. For example, the Code of Manu uh, has another similarly lengthy list. Um, anyone who has climbed on a mound, or an imp impotent man, a man who folds his hands in supplication, who's begging not to be killed, um, someone whose hair is unbound, so if you um, are sort of in a panic and your hair has fallen out of your braid, um, sometimes translated as your hair is disheveled, which I think always gets me off the hook. Um, anyone who is seated, or who says, I am yours, um, anyone asleep, without armor, naked, without a weapon, not fighting, not walking, or engaged with someone else, so imagining hand-to-hand -hand battle if, if, if PC and I are fighting, then it's not right for Brian to, to attack me from behind. Um, anyone whose weapons have been broken, anyone who's in pain, badly wounded, terrified, or fleeing, right? Um, so this is clearly a much broader concept of, of immunity, um, and so the idea here is that one's not necessarily immune because of only who you are, but also of what you